you're a rare animal in our world. You're a flourishing mainline liberal congregation. Uh, may your tribe increase. And since you're forgiving, I thought I'd take a risk and preach to you from the book of Jonah. It's appointed by the lectionary for today. Jonah just has four little chapters, and it's a jewel in biblical literature. There is not a wasted word in this pearl of a story. We usually think about it because of the great fish that swallows up Jonah. And we talk about the fish in children's stories and songs and the like. Don't worry, kids. I'm sure God would never swallow someone with a fish, we say in these stories. Now, if you're Jewish and you think about the sea, it's not a positive thought. The Jews' neighbors, like the Phoenicians and the Greeks, told great tales of conquering the sea and seafaring adventures. Uh, Jews don't do ocean. It's full of sea beasts and unclean things you're not allowed to eat and you drown. So in a Jewish story, being in the sea and then being swallowed by one of these sea beasts is like being under the lowest layer of hell. There's no worse thing imaginable that can happen to you. But I have some illustrations of this because this is usually how we talk about Jonah. Josh, you got my images here? So uh, in our illustrations, we make it seem like kind of pious and sweet, right? Jonah's roasting marshmallows and getting ready for s'mores in there, right? Uh, Or the next one, um, here, uh, the whale looks happy, right? Like, not just Jonah, and Jonah is super pious. I prefer images more like this last one. Now there, the fish looks scary and scaly, And Jonah is praying, sure enough, but he's desperate and terrified. That's more what the story is trying to get at. See, what had happened is that God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, Israel's worst enemy. Go to Nineveh and tell them how gracious and good God is. And Jonah said, right, and he booked a passage to go the opposite direction, to Tarshish. 180 degrees in the other way. So God is not pleased, so God sends a storm, and the sailors, they row, and they cuss, and they pray, and they draw lots, and they say, wait, it's, it's the Jewish guy. It's his God who's mad at him. Uh, what'd you do? And Jonah says, oh, sorry, he wanted me to go bless an enemy. I didn't want to do it, so I'm on this boat with you. And they say, okay. So they try and row their way out of the storm. It doesn't work. And then the next time, they don't even ask Jonah, they just throw him overboard, right? (laughs) Jews are laughing in the story because, have you ever met any pious sailors? The sailors are the nicest people in the world. And Jonah, the one who has a book in the Bible named after him, is trying hard to get away from God. And so here he is in the fish praying. It comes and swallows him up. Now, as good United Church liberal Christians, how do you hear this story? about evangelism, of your worst enemy. I mean, if God asked you to go speak good words about God to the person you like the least, would you do it? Would you go the other direction? Imagine an invitation to go talk about the goodness of God in, I don't know, Washington, D.C., or (laughs) some, you know, unbearably conservative place like the Maritimes or the Prairies where you left home and you promised you were never going back. If God says, go back and tell them how much I love them and their worst enemy, would you do that? A preacher friend of mine imagines getting a letter from the White House signed by Ivanka Trump who says, hey, uh, my dad has all these boot-licking preachers telling him how great he is. I need some preacher to come and convert him away from being a narcissistic bigot into somebody who loves like Jesus loves. And my preacher friend imagines responding, no! No! <laughs> I'm not going there with him. I mean, I know this God. He might convert him. And I don't want that guy forgiven. (laughs) That's Jonah. Now you have a glimpse. Jonah doesn't want to go because he knows who God is. He knows God is merciful. And he doesn't want mercy for his worst enemy. So he heads the other direction. He would rather watch them suffer than watch them forgiven. So God sends a storm and the fish, and God then says, now where were we? 
Oh, yeah, you. You are going to Nineveh. So hear what happens next. The Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah up onto the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message I give to you. So Jonah set out, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a great city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh will be overturned. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity he said he would bring on them. God did not do it. This was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, is this not what I said while I was in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. I knew you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. And now, Lord, take my life. It's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah went out from the city. He made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord appointed a bush and made it to rise up over Jonah, and it gave shade over Jonah's head to save him from discomfort. Jonah was happy about the bush. But when the dawn came, the next day, God appointed a worm. It attacked the bush. It withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah. He was faint and asked that he might die. Jonah said, it is better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? Jonah said, yeah, angry enough to die. And God said, you're concerned about the bush for which you did not labor, which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? That's it. The last word of the great biblical book of Jonah is animals. This is the witness of God's people. Thanks be to God. So Jonah is a story that gets at a lot of the key themes of the entire Bible and the entire Christian faith. Is God for us only? Or is God for us and our enemies? Is religion private property to benefit us? Or is it a responsibility to bless others? What do we do with foreigners? With those unfamiliar with the other? Do we exclude, debase, deport, ridicule? Or love, honor, cherish, make a new us with them? Lots of the Bible sounds one way. Enemies are there for conquering. But in Jonah... Enemies are a test to see how much you love God. Now, I, I would never say this to nice people like you, but I've heard other more courageous preachers like Christine say this to other churches, that you only love God as much as you love your worst enemy. Ouch. Like I say, I would never say that to nice people like you. Jonah is happy about the shade of a bush and curses God when it withers. God says, so you're happy about the bush, and then you're mad when it goes away. So do you think, Jonah, my job as God is to give you what you want? <laughs> do you only love me when I'm at your beck and call, Jonah? Isn't it my job as God to go bless everybody else, to make the world right, to fill it with the love that I am? And then the book ends. We have no indication Jonah ever gets a clue on that. So let me back up a bit. Nineveh is a great city. Scripture says it would take three days to walk across the entire place. It has 120,000 people, which doesn't sound like a lot in our minds, but in the ancient world, it's unimaginably massive. 
So think of the biggest city you've ever been in, right? I was in Mexico City one time, biggest city in the world, and I look out and there's just city as far as you can see. Half an hour later, I look out again, still just city. As far as you can see, 20 million people. God bless every one of them right now, especially. Another time I was in New York and I was in a meeting, World Trade Center area, and someone mentioned Broadway being 100 blocks north. 100 blocks! It's nothing but skyscraper between here and there, and it's only halfway up Manhattan. Cities. It's one of the great human experiments. Can we make them places of thriving and abundance or, or only places where people take from one another? And I confess, where I live in Mount Pleasant, when someone new moves in, buys a house, my first thought is not welcome. It's rather, well, look who had two million dollars to spend on a new house. <laughs> I can relate to Jonah. Nineveh was not just a big city. It was the capital city of Israel's worst enemy. It was the capital of a great empire that crushed Israel under its boot. So in 722 BC, the Assyrians swept down on the northern kingdom of Israel, conquered the whole place, carried off people, eliminated 12, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel from the face of the earth. There are only two tribes left after that in the southern kingdom of Judah. So the biblical book of Nahum, which I know you have memorized, so I don't have to remind you of the biblical book of Nahum, all it is is a scathing denunciation of Nineveh. It says that Nineveh is bloodthirsty. It's full of lies. It compares Nineveh to a promiscuous person. It says that God will bring Nineveh destruction, desolation, devastation. All the world will cheer when Nineveh is destroyed. We don't preach a lot of sermons from Nahum in church. Biblical people then think about Nineveh the way the greatest generation thought about Tokyo or Berlin. Like, what do you want for that place except destruction? I mean, that's what they've done to us, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why Jonah is worried. The reason he runs the other way when God calls him to Nineveh is that he knows God is merciful and the Ninevites might repent and then God would have mercy on them. And it's the last thing Jonah wants. Jonah is the perfect, unpious believer. He knows God is merciful, and he doesn't like it. Not one bit. So some non-Christians understand the scandal of Christian faith better than we who claim faith do. So Graham Greene's novel, The End of the Affair, there's a movie based on this, the affair in the title ends because of a miracle. Not just like a flower or a child's face, but like an honest to God, rules of nature breaking miracle. And so the narrator knows there's a God, knows this God will work miracles, and hates it. <laughs> and so the very end of the movie, his final prayer, he types it on an old typewriter, is God, as for me, leave me alone forever. That's a serious prayer. And that's Jonah's prayer. So there he is. He's on the beach. He's still covered in fish goop and sand. And God says, where were we? Right, you. I had a job for you. Off you go. So Jonah is the least enthusiastic missionary in world history. So perhaps you've sat on a missions committee or a nonprofit board that gives money away to people doing good in the world. They all come to you with these reports, right? Glossy brochures, moving testimonials, usually with crying children, about how important the money is and we need more because it's doing so good. Jonah does none of that. No glossy brochure. No heartstrings being pulled on. He's wearing a scowl and he smells like fish. And he goes to Nineveh. He has no choice. So he walks a day into the city and let's fly. Now, Think of the best sermon you've ever heard. You guys have had some amazing preaching in this church. Bruce Sanguin, Beth Hayward. It's amazing. Think of the best sermon you've heard ever anywhere. Got it? Jonah is not in their company. Jonah preaches a sermon where he says, and I quote, 
40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's the sermon. It's eight words. It's five words in Hebrew. Somebody turned that sermon into me in preaching class. They wouldn't get an F. I'd give it back to them with a lecture about taking the assignment seriously. People expect you to work in these sermons. Amen? That's all he says. So Jonah is a little bit like a petulant teenager, right? You, you make them empty the dishwasher, and they're like, empty the dishwasher? Sure. Bang, slam, crash, too little soap, too much. I'm going to preach this sermon. 40 days and you'll be dead. You like my sermon, God? 40 days and you'll be dead, he says. Who would listen to that? The Ninevites. That's who will listen. They hear that sermon from Jonah, and they repent. All of them. King of Nineveh is in sackcloth and ashes and issues a decree. The cows in the field are wearing sackcloth. Everyone's weeping and apologizing and saying, sorry, this would be like preaching that sermon in Washington and Donald Trump comes out with a list of apologies, right? I'm sorry for the pardon and I'm sorry for DACA and I'm sorry for bluffing nuclear war. It's a long list. It changed between when I drafted the sermon and this morning, right? <laughs> this would be like North Korea and Syria and America and Canada suddenly becoming places of gentleness and grace and love for other people. It's a model conversion of an entire city from the king to the cows. And Jonah is furious. I knew it! He screams at God. I knew you were gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love. You do this kind of thing all the time, God. That's why I didn't want to go. And God says... Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah walks out and won't even answer. This is a glimpse of us, God's people. And it's not pretty. I mean, we're delighted that God loves us, that we're the apple of God's eye, the bride of God's youth. We're the ones God wants to marry. But then we think that's for us and not for others. So we're like the workers in the field in Jesus' parable who've worked all day and are sweaty and then someone else cruises in the last 15 minutes and they get the same pay we do and we grumble and are annoyed with this. What we forget is that our position in God's family, in the apple of God's eye, the delight of God's house is by grace. It's a gift. It can't be earned. It's not because of how nice we are as Canadians. It's because of how kind God is. So one preacher describes our view of ourselves this way. Undeserved gifts are only supposed to go to the deserving, apparently. Here in the book of Jonah, the sailors and the Ninevites and the fish are God's beloved. Jonah, the prophet called by God, a book of the Bible named after him. Jonah is a bratty child. That sounds too mean to children. Anyway, you get the point I'm making. Jonah's anger at his enemy's repentance reminds me of a folktale you might have heard where someone turns up to this farmer and says, you get three wishes. I don't know why it's three. They don't tell us these things in seminary. I don't know why it's not 17 wishes, but three wishes. The catch is your enemy, your neighbor, gets twice whatever you ask for and get. I want a bumper crop. Happens. Neighbor gets twice as much. I want healthy animals who all reproduce. Happens. Neighbor gets twice as much. So he makes his final wish. I want to be blinded in one eye. Would rather suffer than see our enemy prosper more than us. Jonah shows that here after Nineveh repents, he sulks. He retreats to the place where he'd hoped to sit and watch the city burn. And instead, Jonah sweats in the heat. God makes a bush to shelter him, keep him comfortable. And Jonah's thrilled about the bush. It's the one time he's happy in the whole book. But then God sends a worm to destroy the bush and Jonah fumes again. So Jonah is the definition of selfish faith. He loves God as long as God does what he wants and curses the people he doesn't like. Now look who God is in this story. God is patient and gentle 
and funny. So you may have heard these rumors about the Old Testament God being a God of wrath. But in the book of Jonah, Jonah is the wrathful one. God is the mirthful one, the patient one, the one who you want to be with. Nobody go near Jonah, right? God, as the scripture says, is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. God tells Jonah, you are worried about the shade over your head? <laughs> Shouldn't I be worried about a city of 120,000 people and many animals? I love that note about the animals. What about the goats in Baghdad and the llamas in Kabul? Aren't you worried about them, Jonah? That's what God says. God's heart breaks for those who don't know, who are clueless. And the last thing God wants to do is hurt them. God wants them to step into fuller life. The same thing God wants for everything that breathes. Story from my country. Abraham Lincoln was accosted by a woman who'd heard he wanted to be merciful to the defeated South after the U.S. Civil War. And you can see why that war cost 600,000 lives. Probably this woman lost more than one child. We should destroy our enemies, she says. And the president responded, Madam, haven't I destroyed my enemy when I've made him my friend? I love how the only non-church member ever to occupy the White House says the most Christian stuff. I don't know how to explain that, but there we are. So a second thing in this story has to do with feelings, with how we feel. Feelings are fickle things, right? I mean, they move around based on how many likes you get on a social media post, right? I mean, feelings move around based on the weather and somebody's tone of voice and whether it's a B minus or a B. Feelings. We like to do feelings in church because you can manipulate somebody's feelings. I mean, that's why we have the music and the lights and the sermons because we can make you feel stuff, right? Parade kids up here. Etc. So let me explain why this is, and forgive me for going full bore nerd here. In modernity, Protestants especially lost confidence in talk about God. The Bible seemed suspect, and church history seemed awful, and so especially many of us liberals feel this. So the question is, well, what's God talk for? I mean, if it doesn't refer to God and it doesn't help with morality, it, like, what do you have it for? And so one really important answer to that was from a German pietist named Friedrich Schleiermacher. It's hard to say, but fun. And he said, here's what God talk is for. It's for a feeling, a feeling of awe. That's what it's trying to evoke. So faith doesn't refer to a God out there or a workable political program or trustworthy history or morality, but faith can sure work in here to rewire how we feel now that's no bad thing, feelings. I've got a lot of feelings I would like God to rewire, actually. But look here. The book of Jonah disagrees adamantly with that reduced space for God talk. Jonah is the most miserable servant of God in the history of servants of God. Told to go and talk to enemies, runs the other way. It takes pious sailors and a ravenous fish to get him in the all right direction. And even then he goes miserably. He's only ever happy about shade from a bush. Thank God, you finally did something for me, he prays. And then God takes it away. And the story ends with Jonah more miserable than ever. The only feeling in the story is self-pitying misery. And Jonah actually has conversations where God talks back. Here's what does better in the story. All the things that don't have feelings... The worm obeys God. The bush obeys God. I mean, whales and cows have feelings, but it's hard to ask them about them. They obey God. The entire natural order listens to God. Jonah is convinced the whole thing is true, and he's miserable, miserable about it. So here's the thing. Here's what this says. No matter how you feel, God is determined to renew all of creation, to fill the world with God's love and grace, whether we like it or not. And Jonah doesn't like it. In Christian theology, we say that all creation is fallen, it's broken, it's disordered. 
And so our hope is not just for individual souls to go to heaven when we die. Our hope is for God to make all things new, to heal every wound, to repair every tear we've made in creation. In Jonah, it's the prophet who's rebellious. The rest of creation is doing fine. So you notice what I said about Christian theology thinking this, it's out of step with the book of Jonah. The fish, the vine, the cows, the worm, the storm, they all snap to and obey God like soldiers before a sergeant. Jonah is the spoiled one who will do anything to get out of what he's supposed to do. So two sides of this coin. One, always notice that creation is shot through with God's grandeur. Now that's easier to do in supernatural British Columbia than it is in some places. But it's especially true where it doesn't look pretty. Absolutely everything is the source of God's affection and glory. And then notice this. Our own rebellious hearts. It's hard to make yourself want something even if you want it. <laughs> it's hard to make yourself love the way God wants us to love. Ask any alcoholic or substance abuser, can you make yourself do what you want? And they know you can't. And then you're on your way to understanding what we human beings are. Frail creatures in desperate need of one another and of forgiveness. God doesn't leave us to our own rotten desires. God will use creation, the enemy, the poor to make us disciples whether we want to be or not. So just look at Jonah. God is going to get what God wants out of the Ninevites, whether Jonah cooperates or not. It's just better for Jonah to cooperate. So final word for today on this beautiful passage. Jonah goes and tells. He does so badly. The worst sermon in world history, under duress, after a false start and a do-over. And he's not happy about it, but he goes. And he tells. And so should we. So however bad we think we are at telling other people about the little bitty glimpses we have of God, we will be better than Jonah's 40 more days and you'll be dead effort. So I don't know about you, but I tell everybody I know about like TV series I like, you've got to watch The Crown and This Is Us is amazing, and Stranger Things will change your life. Just set aside your whole weekend. You're going to need all of it. But when it comes to the most important thing about me, and I'm a professional religious person, clam up. I want to talk about God. with Some kind of idiot, right? Thank God somebody was more courageous than I am with me. They were willing to take a risk and tell me about a God who loves unimaginably, and wants a romance with me that will change my life and other people's lives. So however stammeringly and tongue-tied we do it, we should tell other people about this beautiful gift God's given us. If you think about it, everybody brags on or rags on their country, right? And I love saying this this morning, surrounded by images of Canadian mythology and history. We all come from some place and, like, you can... Criticize your own mother, but not somebody else's mother, right? But we talk about our country. I love the Indigo Books declaration, the world needs more Canada. Comes from Bono. Now, my country says that kind of thing. It's jingoistic patriotism, but if you guys say it, it's humble bragging, so that's fine. But <laughs> notice, we want to talk about our country with other people, right? But when it comes to God, we just get all polite and clammed up. Any of us will tell a stranger about like our favorite actor, the grocery store they should go to, or why you should only eat organic kale, or annoying personal habits, or our sex lives, and then comes to God, we, oop, oop, not going to talk about Now, we know why that is. So many people have done it so wrongly for so long, like Jonah. <laughs> there it is in the Bible, a testimony to us doing it wrong. Lord, forgive us. But then, thank God, someone else did it for us in a way that was right, that was wise and gentle and critical and kind, and that God asks us to be that person for other people. So friends, if you've glimpsed something of God, however partial, I encourage you to tell somebody else about it. 
Not because God needs you to. God is unimaginably patient. But because doing so will make you more human. And it will make those who hear more human as well. Amen.